I think we're on, Ali. Uh, we're on. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, hopefully you are now able to see us live on YouTube as well. Uh, I think there is a slight time delay. So if you pose any questions or you see us popping up, then we're on. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, hopefully you are now able to see us live on YouTube as well. Uh, and that's me replaying it to myself just then. <laughs> so as you can tell, um, there's a slight time delay and we are technological uh, devolved, is that the word to say? Yeah, I think we've, we've done the opposite of evolution. So, um, and, and also Sam, our filmmaker, is not here with us at the moment, which means that it's a, it's a highly risky scenario. In fact, if, if Sam's watching on this, um, we really wish you were here right now, helping me and Ollie out because, yeah, IT-wise, this could be risky. <laughs> so uh, the way it's going to work tonight is we're going to answer all and as many of your questions as possible. And um, we have two people that are going to be joining us on screen shortly um, with two separate questions, which they've already posed to us, and we'll allow them to ask us to face to face and you can all watch. And um, we also have another screen over here, which has got all of your questions on YouTube for so. If Tom looks over or is typing, he's not doing his emails, he'll be uh, checking your questions and we'll try and get to them as soon as possible. So uh, what we'll do first is we'll invite our first guest onto the screen and Nigel can present us with his question. It's gone well. It's gone well so far, Ollie. Yeah, my God. Hey, Nigel, how's it going? Hi there. All right. Yeah, yeah very good. Well, w welcome to the Ask Lattice session. And um, uh, so far, nothing too much has gone wrong. So uh, you, you've got us off to a good start. Good. Okay. Well, my question is: um, I guess I'm the opposite to the kind of questions you often get from people who are time poor and uh, need their time optimizing. I work from home, so I've got all the time in the world to, to train. I get up early, I can be in my garage, warmed up by 10 to seven. I can go out for a bike ride at lunchtime if I want. And uh, I can also nip out to the garage for a bit more training in the evening. And I've got the regular equipment. I've got Beast Maker, I've got some rings, I've got some weights. I'm going to get a moon board for Christmas. So I guess my problem, uh, the struggle is real. This sounds too good. My problem is I'm either going to end up super fit or just tearing myself to pieces. So I kind of need something to stop me overtraining, really. I've got all the motivation in the world and not much common sense. I've been <laughs> interested. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I think this is a, a very common question, common scenario. Um, and lots of the people in, you know, in the Lattice community that we come across, whether it's our own clients or people that we see um, or sort of chat to on social media, um, and they find that they're very, very motivated. They have lots of really, and there's a lot of good tools out there nowadays, loads of good different training devices. Um, a number of people have home boards at home as well, um, and you know, I know that you're fortunate with this, and uh, one of the things that you can default to is thinking that by doing more, that's doing more and doing more for your own training and progression. And that is almost in all circumstances, not, um, you know, the truth and the, and the way forward, um, especially as um, your, the, your age increases as a climber. Um, and I think there's, there's a degree of, uh, no, I'm not gonna say recklessness, but enthusiasm that you can throw the body in your late teenage years and early 20s where you really can do a lot of training activity and often it will kind of cope with it and, and adapt um but in your case i think the the real key and, and the same for lots of people that i've trusted to over the years is that you really want to focus on the quality elements so the strength element mm -hmm. of your climbing above everything else because this is the one part that you want to try and hang on to the most and for the longest, yeah. not just for performance itself, but also um, for injury robustness um, and staying away from injury, staying in good um, athletic health uh, as you um, go through your climbing years. Um, and it, it's, it's hard to stay in control of this, I think, as we um, get older as climbers, because we see a lower response from the strength training and we don't get as much out of it 
but we feel really good when we go and do fitness training. So the positive feedback loop is often, oh, I feel amazing by doing lots of volume because I get fitter, but I'm just eking out little bits from doing the strength training. So I would say generally do less than you want to and focus on the high intensity strength work and make sure that you're having more rest than you naturally want to do. Um, and as a, as a rough rule, I would say you want to be looking at, even if you feel great after training on a, on a Monday and you think you could go back to another strength session on the Wednesday, is always, always leaving a good solid two days, maybe a little bit more between strength sessions if those sessions are quality, even if you feel like you could have come back on the Wednesday and still done a strength session. I don't think for a lot of people, that's the best way forward. I think it's leaving more space, and more recovery time. I, th I think I mean, there are uh, different muscle groups, even if you were uh, split up into uh, pulling one day and then, you know, pushing the next day. So I'm thinking pull-ups or lock-offs and then dips completely separated. Um, I think I think that's a that's a really good tactic actually, and a lot of um, you see a lot with sort of bodybuilders back in the day where they used to split the muscle groups. I do think there's a there is an issue slightly with climbing to do with it because of the type of movements you might do and the uh, joints involved. So, say the examples you just sent there, if you do pull ups one day, which might include some uh, finger strength element, and then dips another day that's going to be stressing the elbows quite a lot on both of those days. I'm so sure. I think when you're doing it, yeah, you need to think about the joint angle as well, or the, sorry, the joint in action as well. Um, like Tom said, I think the thing is for yourself, all of your equipment is like relatively, or it's kind of designed mostly for the intense stuff. So I mm. think in terms of the quality of session is key. And I think one thing that I've always done and recommended to a lot of people that have home training and this is for, um, I've been lucky enough to work with athletes that are full-time athletes and they have home gyms and this has happened a lot with lockdown is they have a warm-up routine which primes them for the session. And if the warm-ups are going badly, then the session needs to be halved in load. And that's e usually for volume. So uh, for example, one person I'd have would warm up slightly on the fingerboard, then they'd go onto a steep uh, climb training board, sort of a woody. And they would have a load of set problems starting on jugs and then going to smaller holds. And this is the warm up for their fingerboard session. If they couldn't really do one of the problems or felt that it felt particularly hard and everything was feeling a little bit off that day, they would do half the sets on the fingerboard session because I think they're at the point where their body's not ready for that load again. And it just means that it kind of puts a cap on it and it's your backstop. So if the warm up routine is feeling bad then it means you're probably not ready for the session um and it's also one of those things that once it's into a good routine it's something that you can just reproduce over and over if you do something slightly different each time you'll never quite know whether you're ready for the session or not yeah so another another thing that um like the uh, same way as ollie said is that using some very basic benchmarking exercises within your session is a really good way as for tracking whether you're ready to do higher quality uh, strength work or, and whether you're properly recovered from sessions. And a lot of people will say when they first start that activity, they'll go, oh, but I think this might impact my session. I might get a little bit tired from doing some hard, intense fingerboarding um, at the first part of my session, or it might be really hard for me to do some heavy weighted pull-up work at the beginning of my session. But if you actually build that in gradually over time, your body becomes very accustomed to that being part of your preparation cycle for a training session. And it becomes a really good indicator for whether you're ready and primed for high quality sessions. And especially if the session has relatively heavy load. And yeah, as Ollie said, when those days are not feeling right, it's, it's generally a good idea to back off from them. Um, so flexibility then in terms of what you're prepared to make yourself do, be, be more flexible with yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't be like going bull headed, going just because I had it down on the paper that I was going to do this. It was in my plan. You don't have to do it on that day. There's more days in the week. And, you know, everyone goes, but my week finishes on a Sunday. Theoretically, yes, a week does end on a Sunday, but there is also the Monday and the Tuesday and the Wednesday after it. And I think we have to be a little bit more flexible sometimes as 
climbers or athletes to be able to move stuff around as according to how we feel. Is, is it right to ask when, when would you like to peak? Or like I say, ideally based on, obviously we can't really predict everything at the moment, but um, when would you like to peak and what for in particular? Well, I mean, I'm looking at weather improving early next year. So I'm thinking about maybe March, April, May next year, spring next year. Yeah. Thinking back out. I would, um, I would definitely be looking to always start the loading on the conservative side and give it um, a mesocycle at least. Get, so based on what you've done in the past and then the next mesocycle, if you think, so three weeks on, maybe one week off, analyze how successful you've been doing that. And if you really want to push it more, then add a session or two. I think what we tend to do, and I see it a lot with new clients, is week one, we start off relatively easy and they go, oh, I can take more than this, I can do more. And then in the past, when I was less experienced as a coach, I would go, okay, actually, I'll give them a bit more. But then week two, you've got weeks one fatigue ready. And then like you add a little bit more and then they're kind of like, oh, actually, this is, this is probably about what, right. And at that point, week three, if you repeat, it's too much. Mm. So I think make changes with loading across a mesocycle as well. And for me, for a starting point, um, for most athletes, two fingerboard sessions and three board sessions a week is absolute maximum um, on the same sort of terrain in terms of like a moon board is even if you do your ANCAP stuff on there, that it's going to be the same angle the same holds um so i think that is like at least a ceiling to put potentially on your on your training already based right. on on my experience with even athletes like like us two we would struggle to fit that into a week and, and recover well from it so on your three weeks on one week off you on the one on the one week off no climbing specific exercises no ring work no board work it's i i, I would still train everything actually i would just do at least about between sort of 25 and 50 percent of the total load so that's volume and intensity and um, right. and usually we rest weeks i would design for going out or going to a wall and just like you know right. for, so the a good rest week schedule for me is uh, at least getting 48 hours complete rest at the beginning of the week then i'll have a session say on a tuesday or wednesday where i'll have an easy session get the body moving sort of just either easy aero cap but like half a session or a very easy fingerboarding and a bit of climbing then another day or two off and then the next day i might do a little bit of a test run either for the sessions coming up or trying projects so you can have a super intense session but it has to be quite short right. and what that's allowing you to do is kind of test the system out and seeing how well you recovered and see how that last mesocycle made you feel um you might feel a little bit rusty, but at the end of that week, you should feel quite good. And then have another at least day or two rest before starting week one of the next meso. So you can definitely still climb, um, but just try and make sure that you walk away from every session going, oh, I was just feeling good then. I kind of, I don't want to keep going. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Cool. Do you have any other questions regarding how to sort of judge your load on it? On the, on the you know, total is, do you still think you're going to kind of like jump into it and go too hard? I think my problem might be really upping the intensity very hard. Like I will really like do very low reps of whatever I do. So I'll like load up myself with weights and do like sets of three pull-ups where it's really, you know, that's, that'll be a three rep max and that's what I'll do with my sets. So I might overdo the intensity. Okay, so one, so that's where you might benefit a lot from testing and then scheduling out the weeks ahead in terms of load. So right. we were talking about this today, actually. So a yeah. um, really good tactic that I use and one of the other coaches here uses is, um, say you want to increase your pulling strength or finger strength, um, you do test on week one, so 1 RM or 2 RM and a 10 second max hang. Um, if you want to do two of those sessions a week, uh, for each of the next following weeks, one session starts at uh, around 80% or something which is completely manageable. You finish all the sets successfully and you feel quite good afterwards. And then the other session does the same. The following week, you schedule a slight increase in load in one of the sessions. The other one stays the same. So for me on fingerboarding, I've done a schedule over the last sort of three months. One of them, I started at sort of 85% body weight. 
um, and the other one and the other session started there. And then each week I'm going up by about 2% body weight uh, on the hangs and that's slowly progressing. If I don't complete the volume of the session, then I maintain that load until the volume completes. Mm -hmm. So in these fingerboard examples, I'll do eight sets of 10 second max hangs. Originally I did minus 12 kilos body weight uh, or around about that. And then one, uh, both one session always stays at minus 12 and the other session goes minus 11, minus 10, minus nine. And say I get to minus five and I now complete six sets at 10 seconds and the last two sets I don't really, I can't finish. I'll stay at minus five until I complete all of those eight sets and then I progress it again. And it just restricts you from ever going too fast and you know what the next step is. And it also means you can really measure those gains. But the other session kind of, it'll start feeling easier and easier. And after a couple of mesocycles, then you can step that up a little bit. But it guarantees a good stimulus, a strength stimulus, but without overloading both sessions in the week. So I think that's the issue a lot of people come into is they go, oh, I've got stronger fingers. So all of my fingerboard sessions need to be higher. But actually, if it's around 70 to 90% of your uh, max effort, it's still going to be helping those strength gains. That's good to know. Yeah, and I, I was to feel like you have to push it right to the very limit to, to get those gains. But okay, 70%, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so yeah, definitely. The, the maximum I would tend to go to, if you're looking at sort of 80, 85% max load for strength gains, and you're doing a good volume of it, that is by far really, really good. I think um, isometrics can tend to be a bit higher. So we go into the 90, 95% load. But the only reason you should be going to 100% of your load really in training is because your, your 100% has actually changed and you're going to 100% of testing four weeks ago. Nice. So people will see us scheduling into their plans, but actually we'd assume that they've got stronger. And that's why we've given them a load that used to represent 100%. Um, I mean, a lot of weightlifters do this where they don't miss a rep. They're going to try and lift the, the best weight they can possibly do. But in training, they shouldn't ever miss a rep because it's all scheduled out across a huge season. Um, so I think as as climbers where we've got quite uh, vulnerable fingers, we should try and adopt that a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. I hope that's useful. That's great. I could talk about training forever, but I'll let someone else get a word in. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, thanks very much for joining us. And um, yeah, um, hopefully you'll stay along to uh, listen to the rest of it as well. Yeah, will do. Thanks, Nigel. Cheers. So we have got, uh, who have we got next? We've got Luke, haven't we? Yeah. So Luke will promote to panelist. Join us on. Here he is. I think Luke's coming in. Hey, Luke. Hello. Hey, guys. How are you? Great. How are y'all? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. We, uh, we did a little test run earlier and Luke was helping us out with that. So uh, yeah. it seems to be working still, thank God. You're over, <laughs> you're over in the USA, is that right? I am, down here in Texas. Oh, nice. So it's about midday there? Yep, 2 p.m., six hours behind. Oh, sweet deal. I bet, I bet it's really good weather as well, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's like 50 degrees out, which is, I don't know what that is in Celsius, probably 10 Celsius. Oh, you're killing us. Don't tell us. We, won't, we don't want to know anymore. Let's talk about... <laughs> horrible training <laughs> horrible horrible training yeah um so last week i actually just got back from my first bouldering trip to waco tanks um which being in texas is an obvious choice for a trip to go to and i ended up sending way harder there than i could have imagined it was this boulder uh free willy of v10 perfectly in my style oh, yeah. um usually i'm like v6 maybe v7 climber um, and I already knew I was super strong on dinos and crimps and hard dead points and just pure pulling power and everything. But it really made me realize I got to work on my weaknesses and just round out my entire body. Basically, I have like no push strength. I've never bench pressed above 100 pounds. Um, my shoulders are super weak. My lats, my pecs, everything that's not just pure pulling power is um, pretty god awful, to say the least. <laughs> so, uh my question really was, would it be a bad idea to incorporate weightlifting during my first training cycle for climbing? Because 
I do want to increase these general strengths that my body needs to get, but I also want to maintain getting better at climber, uh, climbing and climbing during my weaknesses like slopers and gastons and lock offs and pinches and all the stuff that I hate. So uh, I'd love to gain like 10 to 15 pounds of body weight, but I am kind of worried that it could compromise my climbing. And I just don't know if it'd be a good idea to do during my first time training. Cool. Um, how old are you, Luke? I am uh, 21 and I've been climbing for two years, two and a half years. Oh, nice. Good effort again to uh, Free Willy in that time. Yeah. That's, really good for really good, yeah. So, yeah. so I would say for me, one of the big standouts of this is um, – what you've described so far is a pathway to becoming specifically unbalanced, not only in climbing styles, but also in the potential risk of injury. Um, so people that are particularly good on crimps and, and pulling really hard, um, you will tend to become uh, more and more specialized. And I think doing weights to counter that is a really good way to, to make sure that you stay healthy. And it means you can climb harder, even in that style for longer. Um, there is the obvious risk of if you do put on a lot of muscle mass, you might find those crimps a bit harder to begin with. But I'm really psyched that you're quite happy to, to think about that in terms of the longevity and being a more holistic st style of climber. I think too many of us uh, put a ceiling on our weight really early on in our climbing careers when you haven't actually explored what your body's capable of. Um, so I think it's definitely a good idea in terms of incorporating weights into your training you can do quite a lot without it compromising your normal climbing training at all. Um, the main thing that you need to be aware of is your, the coordination element of your climbing training must be uh, chosen first and prioritized first. So if you're doing any training session, you want to make sure that the climbing element comes at the start of the training session and then the weights element comes afterwards. Just because if you do the weights first, you're going to fatigue the muscles and they won't work as effectively when you're, when you're climbing. And it's like having a, almost like having an injury where your body starts trying to move around in a weird ways to try and compensate for this weakness that you're now got because you're fatigued. And it means you won't learn techniques as well as you would do when you're fresh. So it's always worth to do the weight stuff afterwards. I'd also make sure with that in mind, you don't do any too, any weightlifting, which is too complicated. Olympic lifts, they're absolutely great, but they take a really long time to learn to do well and efficiently and do them properly and safely. So it's something which to add that into the mix and complicated lifting patterns is just not worth it for me personally, unless you already know how to do it or you've got the time. So I'd do your, make sure your weight lifts are nice and uh, simple and do them at the end of sessions. Apart from that, you can pretty much go to town on it as long as you're feeling recovered enough for your climbing and you take rest days as needed. You can definitely work those antagonist muscles pretty hard. Um, for me, I think bench press is something that's really underrated in climbing. And I think unless you're hitting sort of above body weight, you should definitely be doing it really. Um, because I think that is something that makes you so much more adaptable in loads of different climbing styles. And for bouldering, it's, it makes a huge difference. Um, a little tip and a lot of people don't realize is if you're struggling to do that initial pull on a one armor, um, bench press is your method. People never, never think that, but actually that really helps with the start of any one arm pulls. So any big movements is exactly the same. That initial pull, it really helps having that bench press strength. Um, one thing that uh, I think would really help for your shoulders as well, in terms of if you think you've got weaker shoulders, is that upper trap muscles are just completely underrated as well. I think a lot of people think that we're really uh, trap dominant and a lot of people, climbers think they have tight traps. And if anyone's got sort of neck issues, then um, the issue is your, your shoulders are rolled forward and we start to say, oh yeah, I've got a tight, tight chest, tight lats, which you need to relax. But what happens is your upper traps get lengthened and they get fatigued because they're in a lengthened position. So if you're going to do any sort of workouts, you need to really strengthen them to bring your shoulders back and have better posture, which means that you can train even more because you're not going to have any of these tightness issues, which end up leading to niggles in the shoulders. So um, overhead pressing is a, and doing shrugs 
is a really good way to work that. And you can do that after any climbing session because those muscles won't be fatigued from the actual movement. They'll just be fatigued from holding that position after you've trained. So if you start training shoulder press and bench press after climbing, that's a really good method for what uh, method to move forward. Um, but in terms of like the moves, you, movements you can do, that's just a couple of examples which go really, really well at the end of hard bouldering days or climbing days. And you can add them in like once or twice a week. And I think it'd make a massive difference to your performance and longevity. And I think if you're in a peak phase, you could drop it. So, you know, when you go on trips and you really want to perform in the lead up to that or whilst you're away, definitely you can, you can stop it for that period. But the rest of the year, there's no reason why you can't wait lift at the same time. Yeah, I think, I think um, like if I look at, like I've been working in um, climbing coaching at a, an elite level for a good 10 years or so now. And if I look at the, the, the section of the climbing population that have come through who are now in their, their 20s, and this is the sort of new generation of cutting edge boulder, boulderers and sport climbers. And I look at how much stronger, fitter, higher performing that group is there compared to the previous generation. And then I look at the habits of what those athletes did in their training progression leading up to the point where they are now, there's two key things which I think massively changed in the last five years, especially, and kind of like leading into five to 10 years as well. And those are is proper, appropriate, consistent strength and conditioning work. So weights work, TRX, gym, calisthenics. And then secondly is fingerboarding. And if you look at that, there's been a massive generational change in both of those two areas across the climbing industry. And that's resulted, in my opinion, in a much better athlete who performs better, longer, harder, gets injured less and can perform in a much, much more varied way. Because I think if you take some of the, the generation before it, yes, they still climb some pretty hard grades. But if you look at the climbing styles and the versatility in which they can perform, I think it's much, much narrower. Um, and then they're not as um, versatile as the, the newer generation that's come through who are very good with their strength and conditioning in particular. Um, the, the reason I asked about your age as well was um, in terms of your hypertrophy gains and in looking to put on weight, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think you're at the age where just focus on doing quality S and C sessions and your muscles will take care of themselves. Um, the main thing is that you're just being consistent and getting it done. Um, start, you can always start with hypertrophy sets and reps because it's a good way to condition the body ready for higher loads. But us as climbing athletes can move pretty much straight into those strength and max strength um, zones and spend more time there and just keep cycling effectively between them. And uh, you'll put on enough weight to to do all of what you need to because your body will just add muscle mass as needed. Um, I think if we go in trying to put on muscle mass straight away, um, doing all of these movements at your age, you could put uh, excess muscle on that you probably you don't actually need for the movements you're completing. So, um, and I know that for me personally, in terms of working with athletes that are similar age in the past, where if we spend too long in that hypertrophy phase, just hormonally, you'll be like that and you'll just, pretty much stack up pretty quick and um, so it's worth you can pretty much move into that strength zone if you're an older athlete anyone who's sort of um 40s 50s 60s 70s or any female athlete i think you can spend a lot longer in that hypertrophy phase um, and look for those muscle mass gains because it won't quite increase at the same rate i'm not saying you're going to stack up like within a week but um <laughs> yeah it's it just takes some, time yeah and it'll, it'll it'll take care of itself effectively is what i'm saying yeah um, well, that's great to hear about the overhead press and bench press because the lifting program I had in mind was basically just the four main lifts, those two, and then squat and deadlift, um, and then whatever accessory work I wanted to do, maybe yeah. two or three days a week, um, and accessory work, which I think you recommended shrugs for, uh, for the traps. Sounds definitely like a great idea. Yeah, um, yeah um, uh, Giltison shrugs, so it's kind of like uh, lean into one side with a dumbbell. And they're quite nice because you can sort of get the loading right. Um, deadlifts as well. If you want to, if you're feeling fatigued, because deadlifts such a large displacement of the weight. So you're going obviously floor to hips. If you want to get like a similar effect for your core, 
but without having to do as much of the movement and affecting the legs as much. Um, you know, because obviously it's a much bigger distance. You can do rack pull, and that's something I really like doing. And I think a lot of athletes find well because it's really good for extension through your, your glutes and your posterior chain. But it means you don't have to do quite as much work on your legs, which is really fatiguing. Um, yeah. I'd say squats, overhead squats personally is better for me. It opens up your shoulders. It means that the weight will be lighter. Um, but generally, we don't need a huge amount of weight going through our quads. We just need to make sure they are strong enough. But overhead press gets your core working really good and opens up your shoulders and your chest. Um, and then bent over row is like, all climbers are good at that, but then you can always get better at it. So bent over row is like an absolute king exercise. So I think that's another good one to add to it. Gotcha. Notes taken. And uh, at the very beginning, you said you would definitely recommend doing climbing first and then lifting weights, whatever it would be afterwards for obvious reasons. Um, so do you, do you think I should be regimenting my week in a way that is climbing and then weightlifting and then rest day and then climbing and then lifting or just pure climbing instead of climb one day and then lift weights and then climb the next day and lift weights the day after that? Um, I'm uh, not really it depends, I guess it depends on how much you're trying to complete. I think climbing, lift, uh, climbing one day, lifting the next rest is a really good way of doing it. Um, a good example to build on that is doing intense climbing day one and doing loads of um, harder climbing, then doing a bit of fitness climbing day two plus weights. And you can actually do them. To, if it's really easy fitness, you can actually flip them because you're not going to be doing intense enough that you can't coordinate, but yeah, still probably doing it that way first. Uh, if you're less likely to get to the gym, say you go to the gym three days a week, you could do um, climbing plus weights day one, day two rest, climbing day three, day four rest, climbing plus weights day uh, five or whatever it is. Um, so I think that means that it's uh, it kind of spreads it out. I really don't think more than twice a week is needed in the gym or doing weights for most people in climbing. Okay. Uh, even the most elite athletes I work with, I don't particularly do that. Um, I think I've given four, sorry, three gym sessions a week at most, and they are four exercises only per session. So they're doing a maximum of 16 sets um, for that athlete, and that's their entire gym session done. And that is to be done, um, this is when you do split training days, so climbs in the morning, uh, rests, and then gym in the afternoon. Uh, that pretty much answers everything. That was super insightful. So I really appreciate that. Cool. Yeah, no problem at all. Well, um, th uh, thanks for coming along and um, yeah, thank you and taking part. And uh, yeah, have a good good rest of the day. Yeah, and let us know how you're getting on. Yeah. Thank you. I certainly will. You'll have a good one. Bye. Should we answer some of these these questions on uh, YouTube? Yeah. Hopefully okay. that was clear. Okay, we, we only had one one uh, small comment about it, us being a bit quiet compared to the other one. Um, okay, uh, uh, first question here is, will this be accessible after the live show because uh, I can't watch now? I hope so. I'm thinking that we can put this out and it'll... it'll I've, re I've, re I've recorded this just in case. Ah, I, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we think, it'll, we think it'll be here forever. If you're watching tomorrow, we've we've done well. Yeah, and if you haven't, then... Well, you wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's have a look. Questions. Um, do you think it's better to split training days and climbing days, or is it to, or is it okay to mix them up um, on the day? So, uh, could we do, you know, training in the morning, then go climbing outside in the afternoon, or go climbing in the morning and then train on the outside? Um. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Because we are we talking climbing outside, or we talk because yeah, okay, yeah. Because I think one thing that we always I always struggle with is, um, everyone always calls it training and, and climbing, whilst actually, it's all kind of like a mixture to me. So we do a lot. Well, a lot of our training plans involve climbing specific training, so on the wall stuff. So I think it's always good to distinguish between that. So, climbing outside and training on separate days. I think it com completely comes no, on down the same day. on the same day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think it completely comes down to what you 
like to do, what you're actually got involved in your training plan and how quickly you uh, recover. So the three options which I've worked with and do my, I have tried myself is one, doing part of the training first, if that's your priority in the morning. Um, and that might be intense fingerboarding and then climbing outside afterwards, particularly if it's sort of easier climbing, say trad or um, it could even be bouldering really, as long as the priority is the finger strength stuff in the morning where it's the most intense. And then you might even do conditioning in the evening. Uh, the other option is going climbing first, that's the priority. And then afterwards do any training that you need to do, knowing that the training will be compromised. Usually I would not recommend doing fingerboarding or particularly hard climbing after going outside because um, the likelihood is even if you have a very, very easy session, you're still going to be fatigued. Um, we, we've say we go out mm. climbing, tried climbing for the day and I don't think we did anything uh, that comment earlier because we've been looking at wet grit all day, uh, just being cold. Um, coming afterwards and having a climbing session, there's no reason physically that I should be tired from my fingers because I didn't do anything, but I still am feeling tired. So I'm going to compromise that session somehow. So rather than training today, I would train tomorrow instead. So I've got that little bit extra leeway. Um, conditioning and core never before climbing, in my opinion. It's just, it's a lower priority and you're always going to compromise your climbing session for not really a huge amount of specific gains. I'm, I'm only really focus on fingers or intense forward climbing before going outside. Yeah, I think um, the, the combination sessions that I've done over the years and seen work really well with um, clients and athletes I've trained with is that one, they're really good at understanding how if you start doing split days and you're combining lots of different things is reflecting on how that matches with your training history. So just because you've suddenly got really motivated to now become, you know, really pro and be doing split sessions across your day is that you're not doing right. One hour fingerboarding in the morning. Now I'm doing a hour of, um, system board cli climbing at lunchtime. And then I'm doing all my endurance in the evening of that in no way mimics anything that you've done in the past, even if you might be really psyched. And in theory, it's quite a professional thing to do or a high level thing to do, which has good responses. So making sure that you're matching up with that. So I think that's um, really important. And then secondly, I think that the way that I've always made it work well is making sure that the quality is just so much higher priority than anything else when you're doing those split sessions. So if something is complex, it's got a lot of coordination, um, it requires very high intensity or it needs really good skin for it very, very early on the day uh, where you need to get, you need to get the best kind of response or adaptation from it. And then you're prioritizing down through the day. And uh, I think it's important always just to stay flexible. So plan your week out in advance on Sunday night, I think is a good time. Plan the week out and just be willing to adapt or even drop sessions as needed. Uh, the worst thing you can do is get to the weekend and have a couple of fingerboard or intense sessions to do. You've managed to get outside, the weather's better, or you've had time availability. You're already feeling tired and you start trying to really cram that extra training in. Um, consider what you've done outside and see what it's most similar to and what you can take off your normal training plan as a replacement of that. Oh, good question here. I, I like this one. Uh, this one is from Tristan. Um, well, I think it actually might be Tristan that we know. Hey, Tristan. Um, uh, so Tristan, uh, a question here about um, if your, your kind of good climbing area is five plus hours away from where you are and but you have decent climbing, which is okay, nearer to you, how do you prepare for the hard rock climbing if you're climbing locally, either training, training at home, or if you have a local area which isn't so good? And I've had exactly the same issue myself. Um, and with cracks. Yeah, with, with a very, very similar situation. And um, my kind of go-to method for that is creating challenges and eliminates around things um, in your local area. So, so, so what's the, so the background of this, I guess, is say like Century and all the stuff in America. So it's a bit more than five hours away. So it's <laughs> yeah, 15 yeah. hours away. And the Peak District, which... Though it does have some cracks, nothing particularly hard. And there's only a few around which provided a little bit of difficulty. So 
I guess you were crack climbing and training for that for a good, well, several years with a local area that's not quite good enough mm -hmm. with a few bits and then a distance one way is what you're training for. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, and that just works really well because you're, you're essentially faking difficulty and quality and ingenuity and learning in your local area by creating challenges and eliminates. And especially if you can get a psych partner, it's really good fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What, so what? Uh, in fact, that's what we were doing today. Yeah, yeah. Me, me, me you and JP. Yeah, we, so uh, we were just climbing one-handed uh, just to try and add a little bit of difficulty to our slabs. But so in terms of outdoors challenges, I know you and Pete have made up some as well. Have you got mm. any examples of those, how you approach them? Uh, so it's typically stuff like um, one-handed climbing, um, taking all the best holds on a route and standing at the bottom and going, right, we're not going to use that section, that section, that section. We're not going to use any of these holds and just taking things out. Um, and you can suddenly turn something which you might have as your classic 10A of the area. But if you're actually pretty good about being creative, you can turn what is a really good quality 10A into a really good 12A or 13A if you're creative enough about creating a limits and challenges. Um, and especially because you will often have to climb it in a much more different style than you would have typically. Uh, it's a really good learning process. And I think it translates well back into hard rock and other projects in other areas because it's on rock, it's specific, it involves a lot of learning, a lot of adaptation, and this is great for your climbing. And I've seen that work really well. So um, another example of what you could do, which is something I've used in the past, is if I'm training for sport climbs in Europe, which are particularly fitness-based and they're really long. Um, locally to me, I don't have anything that long and definitely not anything particularly pumpy. So what I'll do is I'll use the local climbing, which is short, intense, and very bouldery to train for the crux moves of the longer climbs in Europe and getting really good at that power endurance element. And then I'll use my training facilities, like obviously the wall behind us, uh, to do loads and loads of longer end stuff and really pumpy climbing. So I'll use the training to work specifically for the long end of stuff for the goal. And I'll use the local stuff for the bit that is good at. Vice versa, if your local area is really easy climbing, then you could do all the intense uh, part of climbing and training and then do all of your mileage element of training. So all the aero cap, uh, trying to get pumped by doing reps. You could do that on the local crag. So you get loads of climbing movement in outside still, uh, but you're using it for what it's best uh, applicable for. You know, I've just been looking through these uh, uh, questions here, Ollie. I'm getting a worrying amount of crack questions in here. Crack think, questions. Yeah, I think people have come over from the Wide Boys channel or something, and they're, they're spamming us over on Lattice. So I I've, I've, I've recently began the journey into, uh, into cracks as well, unfortunately. So I've been in uh, training with advice from Tom, uh, ready for a uh, green spit next year with Maddie. So it's going to reflect very badly on me if you do well, if well, badly, you know, if, if I don't do well. Yeah. 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 So if I don't do it next year, then don't listen to him about crack training. <laughs> oh, actually, I've got actually got a really good question here. This is, um, I like, it's a good controversial one as well. Um, okay. So, um, I want to become a stronger climber. However, I've noticed that lots of people train by doing more work on exercises than actually climbing. How can I train as much external, no, how, how can I train without as much external training, so all the weight stuff? It makes me not want to get a training plan from any company as I, do want, I don't want to do nothing but hangboard, campus, weights, pull-ups. Oh, wow. This is a good question. Um, so I guess probably one thing as a, as a precursor to that is, I think we discuss this a lot at, as the coaches of the team. If you can climb, you've got energy and the time to climb. That is the priority. And in terms of our training that we give out, we have climbing training and then we have accessory stuff, which includes fingerboarding and so on. Sometimes fingerboarding takes place, uh, takes priority because that's a quick, controllable, easy way to get better. But if you can get the same gains by climbing, then that is, becomes a priority. We'll always do that first. Um, fingerboarding is great, and it's it usually added in because you can do it at home. Most people don't have climbing at home. So I would say, um, at least for us in our experience, if you, you can develop pretty much any of your strengths climbing, and I think we spoke about this the other day in terms of training outside, is mm. 
if I want to train someone to get shoulder uh, stronger shoulders, uh, you can get you get them using the rings, you can get them using weights. But if I could set 3D problems that specifically got you to push your shoulders in open positions, you could open them up, you could be pushing below, you can be pressing into a roof. Then that's what I would actually do. It's just that most people don't have that available to them. So if you're psyched to train through climbing, I think that's brilliant. And we, all you need to do is be smart about it. Yeah, I think it all comes down to really the, the, the you know, the reality is that it depends on what time and resources that people have available to them. So if you're lucky enough to have 10, 20, 30 hours that some people have available to go rock climbing every single week and also the conditions and the rock available to do that, then you will invariably have very good response and change in your grade and progression by doing a lot of rock climbing. Yes, you will likely hit either a ceiling or your um, progression may not be as fast as if you'd complemented that with um, more standard stre strength and conditioning exercises with it. But the reality is a lot of people out there don't have the luxury of this kind of setup. Um, and that's where we find that those who are a bit more limited on time, um, they've got a lot going on with their life. They're working full-time jobs, 40 plus hours a week, um, hard careers, um, might have family, multiple children, and they're, they're much more boxed out into smaller amounts of time um, is they just have to be a little bit more directed um, towards some of their exercises. And that's where we have to find that blend between strength and conditioning exercise, whether it's, you know, fingerboarding work or system board work or rings, for example, and how you blend that in with climbing. Because you cannot be successful in our experience with just doing fingerboarding. You just become like, you know, a hanging monkey. All you can do is just hang off a fingerboard. And that's absolutely useless. You're, you know, you can't use your feet. But likewise, is that if you're very, very limited on time and you're struggling to make or achieve overload and create adaptation through just climbing on a climbing surface, which isn't causing that, then you're going to again struggle and you're not going to make as much change and progress in your climbing as you may want to. So it's about that balance of time, resources, focus, enjoyment, motivation, and matching that up with the individual. So I would say some uh, things to keep in mind when you're looking at your training, just climbing is so what, like Tom said, what walls do you have available? What holds are being used and what movement patterns are being used? Because the simplest way to make a mistake by just training through climbing is just board climbing. Like we see loads of people in the UK doing that where they just have wooden holds available, half crimp, and they just get really strong in the same movement pattern and they become really strong, but they could, I mean, it's a little bit better than just fingerboarding, but they go outside on some grip problems or anything that needs a bit of nuance and they're not able to move in that way so just think about making sure that your movement is applicable across the board and you could take any training plan and go okay i'll need to spread it across all these different movement types but just make sure there's a lot of variety in there put your focus in the areas you need to yeah yeah really really important that but good question um i can't remember who asked that i think it might be matt um and we like a good controversial question as well um uh should we do one more question? One more question. Yeah, no, got time for that. Uh, okay, so we've got a question here from Karim, and he's asked about um, push, pushing max red point grade versus establishing yourself on your current max grade. So let's say, you know, your max uh, uh, red point grade is 7C, uh, so like that's about 12C. Um, I think I've got my US grades right there, uh, or maybe it's 12D. No, it's 12D. Um, should you progress to the next letter grade up or do we think that people should you know establish a baseline at that new max red point grade uh politicians answer i think you should do whatever you're psyched for like it just doesn't matter it's whatever you are keen for it is the only thing that really matters uh really is if you want to push up i know people that just jump grades all the time and they love projecting they love getting on that next grade um, but that's what they really enjoy and they're really happy and they love going to the crag and knowing the same route they're going on. I know people that need to do 10 of each grade before they even let themselves get on the next one and that's their method. Uh, for me personally, I fell into a quite a nice rhythm which happened naturally and then when I realized that I actually want to keep it up, I'll do one year of pushing my red point grade and I really enjoy doing that and it'll either be 
through one season in spring or spring and autumn, so the shoulder seasons will be both dedicated to that, pushing the grade up. So I'll push the pyramid up. And then the next year, because I've spent so long on one route usually or you know on one type of climbing, I want to make sure I get variety. So I end up spreading the, the bottom of the pyramid. I look at a lot of mileage. So I've kind of done that year on year. So one year peak, next year base. One year peak, next year base. And that works really well for me. But I think you've just really got to go with your gut on it and what motivates you the most. I would just say definitely try both and see what you enjoy. And don't be scared to mix it up. Yeah, I think a, a mixture of both is is really good. And really the only warning or caveat that I put into it would be that if you end up over a period of years going very hard down one route, so you 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 really go after the you know the huge base all the time and never keep making that that leapfrog of grade up, or if you always just go for the next grade, you do your first. 13a your first 13b 13c and you never build up underneath it i think it's when you go to the the nth degree on one particular strategy and you do that for years on end that's potentially where you might find yourself in a little bit more difficulty as a climber but how you strategically mix both of those as ollie says i think the you know the most important thing is that you're psyched by it you enjoy the process on both of them it works well with your lifestyle your time the training that you're putting in, the traveling that you're doing, and, and you get lots out of it because, you know, climbing, especially in the long term, it's a lifestyle sport. It's for life. We should be hopefully doing this for the, the whole of our life. And we've got to enjoy it. We've got to have this positive feedback loop. So if we're constantly spending our time, you know, trying to adhere to some system uh, that we've read on the internet, that's the, the best way of doing things, or because we saw some guru say, this is the only way to do things. I don't think that's right. I think it's it's having a blend um, and a comfortable place in the middle. I will I will be a little bit controversial, I see, or Ooh, maybe really? controversial or blunt, maybe, is whatever strategy you do, don't complain about not being good at the other one. So the people that... But you are, complain all the time, Ollie. I complain about everything, though, yeah, so it's okay. different. So one thing you can't do is if you spend all of your time climbing 7C, and that's all you do, and you never stick on a project for very long, don't complain at not climbing 8A. Because if you want to climb 8A, you will have to project and stay on something if that's your grade. So if you do one loads and you really enjoy it, you can't complain about not having the other one, vice versa. If you are really good at projecting and you spend a lot of time just bumping up the next grade, but then you haven't done much mileage or your on sighting's not as good in the other areas, you can't complain about that just because you've climbed 8C doesn't mean you can't on site every 7C in the, in the, at the crag. You've got to be able to look at both. So just take a step back whenever you get frustrated about not being good at the other one because uh, that's a little pet peeve of mine where uh, you've just got to look at yourself, like uh, take a step back and look at what you, your patterns are doing. So you're kind of a uh, your result of your actions. Is that the right word? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad that made sense. It could be because it's 9 p.m. and you, you, you're losing the, the ability to speak now. Yeah, yeah. I Normally, Ollie, was... Ollie should be in bed by 9 p.m., really. I wish. I wish. Yeah. Cool. Should we, should we wrap it up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully, that was all right. And that was our first YouTube live. If you thought this was good, uh, then please comment below or let us know on Instagram. Uh, we would love to do more of these in the future. And this seems like quite a nice way to do it. So, if more of you want to come on and talk to us on screen as well, that's also great. It was awesome to have Nigel and Luke on earlier. And it's really nice to see people face to face. So thanks very much, guys, for that. And I guess we'll see you all soon. Yeah, we'll do. Have a great Christmas, everyone.